1970. It was the year the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty went into effect. Gamal Abdel Nasser, the most powerful figure in the Middle East, died in Cairo. American troops expanded the Vietnam War into Cambodia, and the UN General Assembly voted to isolate South Africa for its apartheid policies. The International Peace Institute, IPI, began life in that pivotal year as the International Peace Academy, or IPA. It was founded by Ruth Forbes Young, an American philanthropist and anti-nuclear weapons activist, and its first president was Indar Jit Rikki, an Indian general and UN military advisor who had been a troop commander in an early emergency peacekeeping force. Introduced to one another by Secretary General U Tant, they hit it off right away. I was very enthusiastic of your ideas from the moment you came because uh, I had been thinking about the need for there being some form of a institute where the UN diplomats and military officers and civil servants could go and learn the art of negotiations and peacekeeping and Ruth came with exactly the same ideas and therefore uh, it was a uh, meeting uh, common ground between us. The term peacekeeping is not mentioned in the UN Charter and creating missions was a tricky business because of great power rivalries on the Security Council. So the International Peace Academy set up office in a building across the street from UN headquarters and took it upon itself to train peacekeepers. John Moroz, Executive Vice President to General Rickey. I used to get asked a lot, you know, why are you doing this? Why isn't the, why isn't the UN doing this? And of course the system was called, it was because of the Cold War. Uh, you had then a number of countries, including the Soviet Union and, and China, who absolutely refused to have any preparation for UN peacekeeping. They were against it. So there was not an argument that the UN could do that. They couldn't do that. They weren't allowed to do that. But unofficially there were peacekeepers, as recalled by Sir Brian Urquhart, former Under Secretary General who joined the UN in 1945. We were the sort of peacekeepers who dared not speak our name, actually, during the Cold War, because the Soviet Union did not believe that peacekeeping was constitutional, according to the Charter, and the French were pretty sure that they didn't want to take part in it, they certainly didn't want to pay for it. The strategic concept of peacekeeping was changing, moving from missions involving strictly military tasks to ones with more complex responsibilities of putting into place peace agreements and laying the foundations of sustainable peace. Rita Hauser, an international lawyer who became chair of IPI in 1993. The concept of peacekeeping became more than just the idea of a force that's interposed after two sides have stopped fighting, like in Cyprus, to prevent them from fighting again. It evolved into a much larger concept of peace building, peace making, maintenance of the peace after a conflict, leading people to disarm after you've had a long conflict, like many in Africa, 20 more years duration. What do you do with generations of young soldiers who have known nothing but fighting, reintegrating them into society? It expanded into a very much larger universe than just the term peacekeeping would connote. From the beginning, IPI was designed as a place where UN diplomats and experts could talk in a trusting and confidential atmosphere, simply not available at the UN. Well, I think what you're saying is that the UN has to pussyfoot around very serious problems, and it does, uh, because uh, otherwise you spend all your time answering furious protests from different ambassadors, and there's no point in that. Uh, but it, So, I mean, we, there's a kind of circumlocutory prose, which, the, which I used to write myself. So actually I was rather good at getting veiled insults into it so that people didn't notice the first time they read it. I mean, everybody thinks this is a joke, but actually it's what you have to do if you have an organization of sovereign states who really, the, whose sovereignty is more or less inviolate. You, you can't go around saying that the president of X is a, is a monster or the president of Y is a fool. If you're in the Secretariat, if you're in an organization like this one, you wouldn't have to do that, but you can actually be very frank about things. In addition to giving people a place to be frank, IPI also liked to give them a way to unwind. When we celebrated our 25th anniversary, Boutros Ghali was the Secretary General, and Boutros was a little stiff, very formal diplomat, didn't like to dance, didn't like to laugh too much. 
But we had a marvelous party where Stevie Wonder came and played and we had dancing and it went till almost two o'clock in the morning. In 1990, General Rickey, the founding president, was succeeded by Olara Otuno, a former Ugandan foreign minister and UN ambassador who had been forced for political reasons to leave his country in 1986. Olara brought the perspective of Africa and the Third World and his own particular family history where he had to flee his country, became stateless. So he somewhat symbolized a lot of what was the world at large. Very early on, in the early 1990s, uh, almost 20 years ago, uh, IPI started to work uh, in Africa with the African countries, with African organization, with African values and standards. Edward Luck, Senior Vice President for Research and Programs. And I think very importantly, focus heavily in the early years on the sub-regional organizations in Africa. The Africans, I think, more than any other region I can think of, are open and accepting and eager to have input from the outside. They appreciate IPI because IPI is not, it didn't suddenly discover Africa yesterday. The head of IPI's Africa program is Adonia Ayabari, a former deputy permanent representative of Uganda to the UN. The program now has a formal working agreement with the African Union. What IPI does is we ask the African Union what are their priorities and we work with them on their priorities. The Africans in New York, especially the diplomatic community uh, of the African ambassadors and other diplomats regard IPI as a partner. They come to our events, they attend our launch of books, uh, especially the Beyond the Headlines where our African authors have found a home and they come to other events, policy events at the UN that regard the UN and Africa in general. One important way IPI has drawn attention and spread its policy recommendations is an ambitious schedule of publishing books, reports, and papers that have become essential reading in the UN community, in academia, in government circles, and beyond. It became a particular focus under IPI's third president, David Malone, a Canadian scholar and diplomat who took office in 1998. He certainly beefed up the publications. We had so many publications coming out, you know, there was something of an avalanche. Uh, the book we wrote on a decade of sanctions, how sanctions work, why they don't work, where they failed, has pretty much become the Bible on sanctions and is quoted all the time when sanctions are contemplated. It's even figured in the debates now on sanctions on Iran that are being discussed. To broaden its outreach and enhance its convening power, IPI created a state-of-the-art website and inaugurated its Trig V. Lee Center Meeting Hall. The number of events there doubled to more than 100 per year. The center has also been the setting for private dinners, bringing together Security Council ambassadors and visiting national leaders from conflicted areas like the Middle East and for addresses by heads of government and ministers and appearances by noted authors and international speakers. Every year since its founding, IPI has held a high-level seminar in Vienna, which assembles people from around the world to advance IPI's international policy agenda. Michael Doyle, Vice President and Senior Fellow under Olara Otuno. There was no comprehensive either doctrine or experience that uh, officers could go through to prepare them to be good peacekeepers. They all came from their own separate militaries. And the Vienna Seminar was, in the gentlest possible sense of that term, a boot camp, that brought together senior officers to talk with each other, hear even more senior UN figures from the heads of peacekeeping. As the UN assumed the responsibility for training peacekeepers, IPI went in a different direction. We did decide to move in the direction of research, partly because uh, training was being taken up by DPKO itself, and we are entering this new world of complex, multi-dimensional peacekeeping operations, where the days of monitoring the green line, difficult and important as that was, were changing into something of the equivalent of peace building that is trying to, first of all, persuade factions to come to a, a viable peace agreement, and then helping to implement that with a view to creating a self-sustaining peace. 
The purpose was for these ideas to be of some use in the development of policy by member states of the UN and regional organizations, but also, of course, by scholars, by NGOs, uh, and others. And in that, I think we were quite successful, and I think IPI continues to be very successful in that area today. In 2008, IPI dropped Academy from its name and became an institute, reflecting its dedication to research. As a sometime academic, I very much appreciate the difference between traditional academic research, which is very important in its place, and the kind of policy research that IPI does. Because IPI is obviously very concerned about practice. We're very concerned about making a difference. Not just a difference in terms of ideas and, and research and footnotes, uh, but a difference in terms of the policy process and policy outcomes. Basically, our research agenda at this point is in four parts. Uh, one has to do with the core issues at the UN, the core competencies of peacemaking, peacekeeping, and peacebuilding. That's traditional. That has to be there. The second part really deals with transnational issues, uh, many of them sort of emerging like terrorism, transnational organized crime, and nuclear proliferation. There's a third area which is emerging as important in IPI of human protection. Uh, issues having to do with the protection of civilians, uh, sexual violence, uh, the responsibility to protect very importantly, where we're really very much in the vanguard, uh, and human rights and related issues. And then, very importantly, IPI also says we're not all about the UN and global issues. We recognize that international politics is made up by region by region, uh, place by place, uh, and we're applying international norms to regional action and regional threats. IPI's distinctions is its close working relationship with the UN. But at the same time, we've had enough independence, that is, uh, both as a matter of culture and as a matter of commitment by the board, that when it comes down to the hard cases, we call them as we see them, even if we embarrass our friends across the street. Forty years on, IPI continues to advance the hopes of its leaders and its founder, Ruth Forbes Young. Often when I'm at the academy and I look out the window and see all those beautiful flags and those tall poles, it's very moving. And I am feeling very humble about what we could do in this world, but that actually small groups can get make, make things happen. IPA, in my view, should be known for two particular qualities. The first is it's instilled trust in its interlocutors internationally and at the UN. Secondly, it's always sought to be dispassionate, unsentimental, lucid in its appraisal of UN potential, in its appraisal of what and who matters at the UN because at IPI, our advocacy is really for peace, it's for security, it's for a stronger UN, it's for multilateral solutions. It's not for each individual issue. So, you know, people can come here and they know they're not going to be preached at, you know, we're not going to tell them, we already know the answer and you've been asked here so we can tell you what the answer is. It's we're part of a mutual exploration to find the right answers. Terje Rode Larsen of Norway, a noted Middle East negotiator who became president in 2005. We are going through deeper changes in history than ever, technologically, demographically, economically, politically, uh, institutionally. But in addition, these changes are incomparably happening faster than ever. One of our foremost challenges is 
first and foremost ourselves to adapt to these new realities, but also adapt in such a way that we can be helpful to um, change the policies and structures and goals of the multilateral system. I think IPI serves a marvelous function. It serves a UN community, it serves a diplomatic community, has a discrete function, it deals with a set of issues and has become very expert in them, brings together academics, practitioners, UN people in a unique way. In my view, it's a little mouse that really makes a big noise. <laughs> Thank you.